Oh, whiskey Jason here, whiskey from the viewpoint of an American here in Germany. Today I have as my guest Brendan Carty from Cologne Distillery. Excellent, excellent that we could make this work. Look, the first people are actually joining already. Greg from Paris is here. He says, Hi, Jason. I might be interrupted by the phone for important reasons, but now I'm here. Curious of this new distillery. Very, very nice. So um, tell us a little bit. How did this young guy start his own little micro distillery, which we can almost see behind me, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why did I not just go up there and meet you? I don't know. But yeah. We, um... oh, we can see it like this way. Yeah, very, very good. <laughs> good. So, yeah, we've been distilling now for just over a year in Cologne. And uh, I suppose we've made a lot of noise in that small amount of time. And I've been planning the distillery for three years beforehand as well. And uh, ever since um, I was in Australia, I'd made the decision, you know, that I should start a distillery. Did Lark uh, inspire you or who inspired you? Lark, more um, more of this guy here. This would be my biggest inspiration. Move it over that way. So this is um, yeah. Bellgrove Distillery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, small distillery, very honest, full of integrity and um, brilliance. Fantastic whiskey. It's my favorite whiskey. Um, made by Peter Bignall. Um, it's a small craft distillery. Of um, he operates off a 500 liter still. And he's starting to expand now, and uh, all of his own rye. And in fact, a lot of the way he makes whiskey is similar to the way they make whiskey in Ireland traditionally, with large amounts of unmalted produce. And uh, yeah, so he also flame feeds his stills, which is an amazing thing. So mm -hmm. I wish more people were doing it. Okay, so what's your what's your history? Tell me a little bit about your qualifications. What started you? <laughs> yeah, uh, qualifications. Well, I suppose I do have a certificate in distilling, but that was a more recent thing. Um, prior to that, uh, I studied architecture for what is it, eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, so I became chartered, and the recession happened in Ireland, so I moved to Australia, and there was plenty of good work there. It was a beautiful place, you know, and. Uh, I tasted a whiskey out there, which, in my opinion, was just as good as one of Ireland's best whiskies. A mm -hmm. uh, 24-year-old pot still, in my opinion. And uh, this two-year-old whiskey, which we can see behind me, was just as good. And I was trying to figure out why is something so young so good. And yeah, so I went down to Tismania and, and tasted the whiskey and met Peter. And um, Peter showed me a few things and we've been in contact since. Um, yeah, so I thought... Irish whiskey, we need to we need to bring some of that integrity into the Irish whiskey industry, mm -hmm. and uh, also one of the main drivers was to create pot still whiskey that I wanted to taste. Uh, pot still whiskey, in my opinion, could be much better, and um, and I think it could be if it was more historically accurate. And uh, now, what tell I mean us a is, bit, what's the difference between single malt and pot still? Well, single malt means one hundred percent malt. Um, it's you know it's a good idea. I think it's. I think it came about over the last um, came about over the last century or so, more so than pot still did. It it kind of filled in the void, if you like, that pot still used to used to have. The pot still um, was the whiskey of choice throughout the world, and uh, it wasn't brandy, it wasn't anything else. It it was pot still, and uh, single malt filled in that void for a number of reasons. Prohibition being one of them. Economic war between Ireland and the UK. Um, the Second World War, probably the final nail in the coffin. But um, yeah, so so basically, it's the mash bill. One hundred percent malted barley is a single malt. If yep. you use a little bit of unmalted barley and oats and rye and wheat, you get a a pot still. <laughs> but more importantly, the rules that govern pot still, uh, in my opinion, are a little bit misled at the moment. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they favour they favour um, a monopolised industry, unfortunately, and they're not I entirely was just historically to accurate. This morning, and he was part of the um, the process of actually setting up pot still, and he didn't even want it. Actually, he said um, he was like, "No, no one needs pot still. No one likes pot still." And they actually <laughs> the garden because they they know the card convinced him. Yes, we need it. <laughs> it's like wow, pot still, God. Um, pot still is is a superior whiskey by far. It's much more complexity. Uh, in in the palate, and in fact, Scotland made pot still for a very long time, and um, some of the 
some of the more some of the honest distilleries nowadays are coming back to that pot still culture. You know, they're using mixed mash bills. Mm -hmm. But yeah, oats in particular was a huge part of the pot still uh, history, and and thankfully it's starting to come back now. But oats and unmalted barley, rye and wheat have just as much part in whiskey as as malted barley does. Well, the people in America would agree with you. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. All right, so we have 30% um, malted barley and 30% unmalted barley and 5% of something else that you can add. I think it's the definition right now of pot still. Exactly, yeah. yeah. When, when in reality, if you look at it, all of the historical records show that you had up to 30% um, say oats, rye and wheat. In fact, there's always something lying around here that would help me to prove that because we're always looking at it. But um, Look, I've got a Irish whiskey there. magazine in the house. Great to see you. <laughs> Good man, Sergius. How are you? Uh, Sergius probably heard me singing off the sim sheet before. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, a lot of people haven't, so that's just great that you're here. Actually, I should be visiting you at your distillery at this moment, but the B, the big bad C word got in the way, and so um, exactly. but we'll talk about that in a second when you can tell me why um, <laughs> we postponed our our live stream a little bit. So what, show us some ingredients, please. Um, I, I actually, I didn't- What were you there. looking for? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah here it is. So this here was sent to me by, there's a lot of people in in the industry or, or in the Irish community that um, have a huge interest in this. Um, so Charles Roach sent me this stuff, um, which is great. It's a mash bill from Bandon Distillery. Um, there's also Brian and Fanon from the Irish Whiskey Society that are doing fantastic work. And um, sorry, one second, I get this guy out of the road. You like sit there. So if I'm going to, can we see this at all? So I'm going to hold this by right there. And yeah, um, let's get this a is a mash for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a mash bill from Bandon Distillery in uh, Cork. And if you look at the averages at the base there of the malted barley, the oats, uh, the wheat and the rye, you'll see that the um, the oats, uh, the wheat and the rye come to an average of about 30%. And then what year would this be? And you've got like 38% unmalted barley. And then you've only got about 33 to 34% malted barley. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you about how pot still was actually made? And so it's fascinating. And um, yeah, so the clones about bringing that back and, and bringing those broader mash bills, which are much more complex, much more full body, much more space and much more viscosity back into the mainstream industry. And instead of it being something that very few people can actually get a hold of nowadays, if at all, um, it's something that, that is part of our culture. In fact, we've been making pot still whiskey this way for longer than we haven't. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So I, I totally agree. Yeah. You know? Very good. So David, yes, um, these pot stills are actually your originals. Now, um, Brendan, tell me a little bit about your equipment, if you'd be so kind. Yeah. Uh, so those are the only flame-fed stills in operation in Ireland, I understand. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's it's dangerous to use flame to heat your heat your whiskey, to heat your spirit. Um, for obvious reasons, alcohol is explosive. Um, although we have anti-explosive lights in, in, and as part of our building regulations, um, we managed to have flame-fed stills because, well, first of all, we're still part of the United Kingdom uh, yes. in, in County Down, so there's precedent for it in the mainland United Kingdom. So for us, uh, ignorant people, Northern Ireland. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> so we've got flame-fed stills there, which, um, which add, in my opinion, flame creates another dimension of flavor, mm -hmm. uh, just in the same way peated would add another dimension of flavor or else unmalted produce as well as malted produce would add another dimension of flavor. So uh, flame's essential. In fact, it creates burning at the base of the still. Uh, the amino acids and the sugars caramelize together uh, for what's known as the Maillard reaction. And um, it's a culinary term basically for caramelization. So it's that burny note that we all like in our foods, like searing of steaks or to the top of a creme brulee or any of that, even a bit of burnt toast sometimes is nice. So um, that, that in your whiskey creates another dimension of flavor and much more body. And, uh, and, uh, as well as that, if you see behind you, we've got these big chunky condensers, they're called worm tub condensers. 
So the only people still using those in Ireland as well. Um, they're, they're, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I'm right behind me, basically. Those box, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, so they're highly inefficient things. Um, we would be, I was working, I done a little course over in Scotland in, in a similar size distillery for a while. And uh, we were getting a litre a minute off the same size distill. For us, we're getting 350 mil a minute, which is mm. tiny by comparison. So. Our stills are lit at 7 a.m. and they're turned off at 8 p.m. So that's how long the stuff's sitting in there. So there's plenty of time for burning in the still as well. And uh, those those worm tubs allow for a different condensation as well. So whenever the the, the, the condensate is turning into the into the distillate, it um, it carries with it a huge amount of fusel oils, uh, which are absolutely full of full of flavor, you know, and. Uh, all of those notes are then transferred into whiskey, which creates proper oily pot still whiskey, you know, great stuff. So at the moment you can't sell anything because, or any of your pot still whiskey, because it's not yet three years old, but you have something like um, Irish and moonshine. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. It's on here. Yeah. So this here, um, because, yeah, you can see there's not much left in it um, because it's very enjoyable. <laughs> So uh, this is a uh, potching. So uh, if I hold it to this side, you can see it better. So potching uh, is the Irish for little pot. So it's Ireland's oldest native spirit. Um, it also has a GI protecting it, but like the other GI, it's geographic yeah. indicator, right? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I should explain that. It is another geographic indicator mm -hmm. which protects it, but instead of protecting it, it actually does it harm. Um, it's historically inaccurate. It is lots of uh, bull crap in it, such as whey. Potching was never made from whey. Um, that's a recent invention. Uh, in fact, potching was never really made from potatoes at all. Potching was made from grain, in my opinion, and almost always was. Um, I mean, particularly, it's oats in there and malted barley and unmalted barley. So it's very much like an unaged pot still. So we've got a, our own mash bill for this potching. Um, it's lovely stuff. It's very full bodied. And, uh, Could you share over. that pot, uh, that mash bill with us? Yeah, it's in fact. By all means, that the, everything we do is about transparency in Cologne. So the back of the bottle actually has the mash bill written on it. So it's got the percentages of malted barley, unmalted barley, mara solder, which is another type of malt. So we, we sourced the heritage grain, and then oat and wheat. So um, small Could amount of oat. Could you read it out loud so we know the percentages? Yeah. So uh, but 69.2% malted barley. 23% unmalted barley, 3.8% um, Maris Otter malt, which is just a heritage grain malt, and 2% oat and 2% wheat. So Excellent. we we're playing around with our mash bills and we thought that this was the most palatable one. Um, it's also quite accurate with another recipe from uh, illicit distilling from the area, which is important. And um, it's 48%. So for the Americans, what's that doubled to make it proof? Yes. So, uh, yeah, so it's good stuff, you know. Is it 96% proof? 96% um, exactly. So good, healthy stuff, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, um, it's also excellent. It makes the best old-fashioned because um, whenever you, whenever it's in with, like, um, the, you know, those spicy notes and those real uh, hearty, hearty notes, it just pairs very well. So there's a lot of really good cocktail uh, makers enjoying this and being very creative with it at the minute as well. But for me, I personally just love it straight. Uh, it's delicious. Um, also, an Irish coffee. An Irish coffee is brilliant with it. Or a Cologne coffee, as we call it. Uh, top notch. Yeah. Uh, Kevin asks, are fusel oils good in the new make? If so, why in the days were they patenting stills like the Wallace that would reduce these? Oh, yeah. Um, I think... Um, I'm not entirely sure about the Wallace still, but in terms of the, the patent stills, the, the more more modern column stills, is that maybe what we mean as well? That um, you know they were they were introduced to create uh, a very efficient means of creating spirit, which created a uh, green spirit. Uh, so green spirit is um, green spirit is is more like a vodka, you know, and uh, but it, <laughs> it's got very little oils in the spirit, you know, but. For me personally, uh, our pot stills are designed to capture as much oil as possible and make a very viscous spirit. But you're right, it's more about your cuts. If you if your cuts are too broad or you cut too late or you cut too early, you get a lot of bad flavours in there. So we always use our nose when we're doing our cuts. 
Um, we're very careful about that. We want to make sure that our hearts are spot on. Um, even with our fermentations, our fermentations are done outside in the open air. Um, oh. We let them cool before we pitch Wild our yeast. yeast and we add yeast. Yeah, we add yeast, but we encourage as much bacterial and yeast infection as possible when it's cooling down, first of all. And it creates this lovely, tremendous, bitter wash, this real bitter beer, which is full of flavour. And uh, a lot of those citrus notes like pineapple, probably a brewer's worst nightmare, but for us it's brilliant because those conjurers then follow through in the stills and, and create a much more complex whiskey for us. All right, very good. Now let's go back to your pot stills. Um, they are not very common. Where did you get them? Uh, we got them in Portugal. So uh, great guys were able to make them for us by hand. And uh, they're Olympic stills, um, but they've got a unique... Uh, head on them, a, good, a unique head neck, which is um, more similar to a Northern European style neck. So it's a hybrid still. So it's flame fed. They're the only people we could find that would make flame fed stills. And then also in such a way that's a mixture of Northern and Southern style, which is um, at the minute, pot stills tend to follow this one prototype um, from Scotland, which is, is good in a way. But uh, I think the diversity of stills in Ireland at the turn of the last century was much more interesting than it is today. And uh, for us, we just tried to bring this back, you know, and, and uh, these stills are going to create a unique spirit for a very long time because of that. Now, you're in Northern Ireland. <coughs> Why not area? Why not Cork? Why not Middleton? Why not someplace else? <laughs> Why are we there? Uh, I suppose this is where we're from. The Mourne Mountains is is our home. The Mourne Mountains is a beautiful place. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, it's where I'm from. It's where Liam's from and where Shane's from. And those are the. Will, will Liam be joining us? He should be. Liam's fond of a cup of tea at this time of the day. So, uh, <laughs> might not. <laughs> he might not. You know what he's like. So he's got the link anyway. So if he if he joins in, he joins in. Okay. But uh, he wanted to come here as well, but a bit of social distancing uh, at the minute. <laughs> so he can join in through his link, no problem. Very, very good. Yeah. Now tell us a little bit about the grain. Where do you source your grain from? How much grain do you need? And how big are those pot stills actually? The grain, uh, well, the rye that we've used to date actually mm -hmm. came from, from Ireland. Uh, it came from, it, it was Irish grown rye. And this was the first year that the, the rye was commercially grown in Ireland. And... Um, so we had a company sourcing that for us, which was great. And then after that, we've um, been sourcing peated stuff to an extent from Scotland. But more importantly, we peat our own. We peat our own oh. on site. So we've got our own our on site smokehouse. So we 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 smoke as much as we possibly can. And uh, there's Liam coming in now. <coughs> He's watching that. Good man, Liam. Enjoy your tea. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we we smoke and malt on site as well as much as possible, um, but it's it's a very laborious task. But um, we find that whenever we smoke our own on site, it's much more peaty than anything we can buy in, which is great. Um, so there's no real consistency in our in our casks. Some might be a, a little bit more smoky than others, and because of our uh, we rely on nature as well for our fermentations. Um, some of our fermentations are tasting different from each other, so. That idea of a consistency across the board doesn't exist with us. Um, in fact, it's quite quite seasonal, our fermentations and our distillations. Now, David asked about your yeast. Do you develop your own? Did you buy something? What about your yeast sources? The yeast, so we do a, a mixture, David. We um, we keep some of our own slurry from the previous um, fermentations and throw it back in with the second. And we also add, Very good. Yeah, and we also just add our own uh, in there to top that up. So it's about 50 50. Um, so it's efficient as well. It means you don't, yeast's quite expensive. And uh, But at the same time, uh, we rely on a lot, we really rely a lot on, on um, bacterial and yeast infection whenever we're cooling the wort down. So we, we encourage the wort to cool down naturally outside when it's open to the environment. Uh, you'll notice that the, the lactobacillus bacteria up where we are would be in a different one from. You know, the lock shore at sea level or maybe in the neighboring town or in Dublin or in Cork. So that idea of the, the Ireland's famous for its regionalism and the difference in its accents and its dialects of the Irish language and people and, uh, and, and, and sense of humor and, and culture and, and song and everything. And, and we believe that it, that's the way it is with whiskey as well, you know. All right. So we know that we have different sources of grain. Tell me a little bit about the mashing. Um, how do you do that? 
<laughs> mashing is quite remedial. We basically we've got uh, a converted dairy tank, so everything in the distillery is converted or upcycled as much as possible. So we created a false bottom on it, and the we mash on we we mill on site, and all of our grain falls down in there. Our oats or wheat, malted barley, unmalted barley, and um, we've got two staff that work with us and we get a paddle a boat paddle each and basically mix it together and create uh, Ireland's <laughs> biggest bowl of porridge and uh, stir it and stir it for about an hour and um, let it sit then for an hour and uh, then we draw off our, our, our wort and yeah it's it's quite efficient we, we get a very good yield and we get a very good workout as well so um, <laughs> it's good for the environment less energy used <laughs> Very good. So uh, at the moment, of, of, of the big rage is hand sanitizer. Have you also made some this week, or how did you? What are you doing? Um, luckily, uh, there was the um, because we're part of the United Kingdom. Um, we um, teamed up with the British Distillers Alliance. Uh, we lobbied HMRC in, Go in, in Glasgow, who relaxed their regulations because um, it, it's very well governed the, the distilling industry, and. Um, and the rules are very stringent, but they, they turned around and changed it very quickly so that we could make hand sanitizer, which is very much needed. We know a lot of nurses in the NHS here who are struggling. Um, I don't know if you know it, we've got this crazy government here that have been running the NHS into the ground now for, for the best part of the decade um, with very sinister ways of doing it. And they've seen this coming. We, we've seen this coming from China a long time ago. They don't give a shit. So um, it's up to the local community again to pick up the pieces. And, um, all of the distilleries have been doing this. Acklandville, for example, have been doing a really good job of this. And they've been helping us out and, and telling us, you know, how to source materials and bottles because there's no alcohol, there's no bottles, there's no hydro hydrogen peroxide, there's no glycerin, uh, there's no bottles left anywhere. So we're all teaming together to try and get plastic drums and stuff. So this is the first bottle that we had, a little pot. It became a pocket sanitizer because it's the only bottles we could get our hands on. So uh, this is made to the World Health Organization formulation um and that was recently approved by hmrc it's a liquid it's not a gel but there is glycerin in it and um it we've been distributing this as widely as possible uh, we live in a in a, a quite a densely populated rural area um it's it's hard to imagine so the regional towns everywhere and um, so we try to distribute it wherever possible to the district nurses in those areas who are wide open they've no ppe at the minute at all pardon me so yeah, there, there's a good, a good solidarity with the local distilleries in the areas, but we, we can't keep up forever. We're a very small distillery, so um, we might have to start to sell some at the same time as giving some out um, to the nurses. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So you can distill up to 80 or 90 percent, or how do you do it with your pots? Yeah, we, we distill. Our, no, our pots, in fairness, only distill up to 70 percent. Exactly. So most times 68. So for us, we've got a license to buy in. Uh, high strength alcohol so we buy in alcohol at 98 percent or else 96 percent and then we dilute it down using the recipe by the world health organization in fact you can't work with alcohol below that so it has to be pristine alcohol that's coming in and even that supply stopped now so yeah <laughs> we'll see what happens you know but uh, yeah we just have to work with what we've got and uh, everybody working together uh, definitely helps because it's a really good distilling industry especially in county down you know we've got great camaraderie amongst the other distilleries here and we help each other out and we enjoy each other's successes and um, really want to make the area, you know, the new distilling capital of, of, of Ireland. So looking forward to that for a few years. Very good. So Greg asked the question, uh, does the distillery intend to create single malts or blended whiskies or single pot stills or all of the above? Yeah, so blending is a fantastic art. Uh, it's something that we really believe in. So blending and bonding is brilliant. It's enjoyable. So yeah, we focus on it. Making single pot stills is our primary goal. Um, we also make very loose pot stills. For example, we made a pot still for charity um, a few months ago there, and it was 60% uh, oats. Um, so that's a very... That's a unique whiskey, and it's probably the best spirit we've ever created, to be honest. Mm. We also done a 90% smoked rye, which was amazing, but we, we destroyed it in some casks that we thought would be good, which is an expensive learning curve. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, we're all about experimentation and bringing that to the fore and hopefully releasing it in a few years. But one thing that we, are, uh, we haven't done yet is a single malt. Um, 
for me, a single malt is, to be honest, I think it's a bit of a fallacy that's been born out of the last century. Like, fair enough, single malt was being made, but by no means was it the whiskey of choice. Even in Scotland, it wasn't the be all and end all until whiskey legislation permitted it in recent years. Pot still was alive and well in Scotland as well. And I think I think people are starting to realise that now. So single malts are brilliant. And we actually might start one this week because we've got a lot of malt, but we've got no unmalted left and we've got no oats left and we've got no rye and wheat left. So out of necessity, we might have to distill off with what we have and create our first single malt. And maybe we could call it the COVID series in about three years. Time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very, very good. Mr. Kyle asks, any hint for what next for the bonded experiments or experimental, experimental series? Um, I think this time we're going to go across the Atlantic again um, and do something, <laughs> something from that region. The last time we went to the Basque country, so we went to the more southern Europe. So tell me a little bit about the expressions you've so far um, um, put out. So you are having, you have source whiskies at the moment as well? Yeah, we did indeed. We sourced whiskey from um, Great Northern, which was um, originally distilled in. Um, they were, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to mention names. We stood, so we sourced whiskey from County Louth. And, yeah, uh, very good. We very good. I won't tell John. Very, <laughs> they were very good at helping us out. Um, they were a brilliant distillery. Um, the master blender and owner, he knows his stuff. He creates very good blends as well. So it, it consists of um, 5% malt and 95% unmalted. So there's, there's malt and unmalted in there, but then at the same time, through the, probably the fifth person, we, we sourced um, our own whiskey as well, our own, our own uh, 12-year-old um, malt from County Antrim. And uh, it's lovely stuff. It really is a cask strength. And whenever we merge the two together, nobody's done that in Ireland yet. I don't know why nobody has decided to... To, to blend the whiskies from County Louth with County Antrim. Um, maybe it wasn't working, but when we done it, it worked very well. We find the right ratio, we find the sweet spot, and it took a bit of tinkering to get there, and it's great. Um, we, we, we put it into a selection of single casks. One of them didn't work too well, um, so we didn't release it, but there was um, we've got a range of, of beautiful casks there that, that are you know, ready to go to the market, and... Uh, but it's it's great fun. It, it certainly is. The first one was working a little bit with David Watch, or who's the blender at the GND. <laughs> yeah, um, we got Brian Watt. Yeah, give us give us good help there. He, he, is good, he isn't he? <laughs> he's, he's a very good blender. Yeah, he, yeah. He's a good guy. So, and he's very supportive of the industry's growth as well, which is great to see. Yeah. Um, so um, we have um, our first one was a dark rum cask. Um, mm which was great and uh, it, it was received very well uh, we whenever we release our whiskey to the industry we don't you know some people talk about no chill filtration a clone we say no filtration whatsoever <laughs> straight from the cask into the bottle if you get bits of char floating around inside your bottle you're lucky so just <laughs> bottle it up and enjoy it and uh, there's john, john donovan giving a bit of i like that right we're kings aren't we <laughs> So a little bit of the black adder, you have a little that little grate to get rid of the charcoal, but other than that, everything in the bottle. Exactly. Get it in there. And even if it's a little bit of anything else in there, if it's a bit of foreign matter, it's fine. At the end of the day, it's been lying in a cask for, you know, probably the most of that stuff's been in there for 12 years in high strength alcohol. So everything's perfectly safe. Um, no added color whatsoever. Very much against adding color and chill filtration. And in fact, we're, we're, we're against dilution of whiskey as well. For us personally, our, our idea of a whiskey is that it should be cask strength and allow the consumer then to, to dilute it down. So I know we're only selling 50 CL bottles, but you're getting the same amount of alcohol in 50 CL as you would be in a 70 CL. And everything for us is small batch, you know. And our second bottle, we've got one up here. They, they come in these little uh, bags as well, which are... Um, ethically sourced so yep. a lot of things in the world today are made uh, you know using cheap labor which is unfortunate but there's a guarantee that this was ethically sourced both uh, socially and environmentally which is important for us uh, and then we've got these um got this little bottle here which is a uh, this is the chocolina bottle so um uh chocolina um, is oh no this is the dark rum bottle sorry the <laughs> oh, this is the dark rum. so you'll be able to see I must have drank the chocolina. You can see oh, this yeah. floating around inside the bottle, which is yummy stuff. 
But um, if you can see the bottle, you see that everything's written by hand on the front. Um, we've got handwritten, hand, uh, hand numbered as well. And at the top, they're all wax dipped by hand. And the back of the bottle, the amount of units. Um, so there's no equipment, there's no machinery used from start to finish in our process. Everything's done by hand, even the, the bottles are done by hand. And, um, I haven't got my chocolina with me at the minute, but uh, the Basques have their own language, have their own culture, uh, they've got their own wine as well. They've got their own grape, which is indigenous to that part of, of Europe, and uh, it's, it's beautiful stuff. It's very tarty. Um, if you drink too much of it, it can be quite aggressive, but it's a lovely wine. And uh, we wanted something to age or to finish our whiskey, and it would be very, you know, very strong. So we like to age it and pull it out at the last minute just before it's overdone. And we find that, uh, yeah... Chocolina is brilliant for that. Um, it worked very well. But to add a wee bit more spice, literally wood spice and, and those fruity notes, we put um, virgin acacia heads on this Chocolina cask. Oh, and uh, yeah, so it, it just added a hell of a lot more flavour and a lot more spice and poke. So the lot wanted more of those vanilla notes, much more heartiness. And this one was, we found it was much more lively and fruity. Um, the, the last one would be a bit more mellow. But um, are you doing single cask? Or what type of size are your bottlings? Everything's a single cask, yeah. So this series is single casks the whole way along. So we hope to do five, maybe six max, and um, a year or um. <laughs> every every time we get a chance, we hope to release one this week. Believe it or not, okay. but um, this COVID thing just messed everything up. Um, my staff are off sick, so it's just me and my own and. Um, up there at the minute, so we we have to um, we have to restring, but we think and, and just strategize what we're going to do going forward. And I was hoping to distribute it around the country, but I know today my sister runs a pharmacy in Drogheda, which is down in a neighboring county in the Republic, and she got stopped on the border today. So they're now stopping people moving around for no reason, but because she she was running an essential service, they let her let her go. So there's a bit of a lockdown now, so it might create difficulties in this next whiskey launch, but hopefully we'll release it in the next week or so. Will you be expanding to other countries? I know you're coming to Germany soon. Monica yeah. Spitzer is your distribution partner with www.irish-whiskies with an S.de. Um, what about France? Any plans on that? No, um, not just yet. Um, hopefully we will go there, but I really can't wait to, to Marika Spitzer's um, welcoming our stuff into into Germany. It's brilliant. We were going to go over to a festival there now next month, and that's been bloody cancelled as well. But uh, look, as soon as this, there's any restrictions, we're going straight over there, and we're going to start. We've got a lot of friends over there, um, and a lot of people who are, who, are, who are waiting for our spirit, so I just can't wait. So Germany, here we come. Where exactly is the distillery again? Uh, the Mourn Mountains uh, are up a little lane called Kilfechen, uh, which is in Cologne, um, in, in County Down. So it's a highland maritime environment, and it's overlooking Carlingford Lock, which is great because there's fluctuations in temperature all the time and fluctuations in, in air humidity. So there's a lot of quite fast aging in our casks. Uh, the, the, the liquid's moving in and out of the wood very quickly. Um, so that whole idea, just that local area, is creating... Um, Creating very, very good aging, aging for us, you know. And, and uh, usually you'll be double distilling, right? One hundred percent, always just double okay. distilling. Uh, can I just butt in with three myths of Irish whiskey? The three myths of Irish whiskey are: Irish whiskey is smooth. That's bullshit. Number one. <laughs> uh, Irish whiskey is triple distilled. That's bullshit. Number two. And <laughs> uh, Irish whiskey is non-peated. That's bullshit. Number three. So historically, Irish whiskey was just as much bull. <laughs> Peated as it was non-peated, um, as well as that Irish whiskey was double distilled, and and, and sometimes it was triple distilled as yeah uh, yeah, but most of it was double distilled, you know. And um, what was the other one? Smooth. That's that that was an insult. We were supposed we had to survive, so we had to reinvent ourselves as something like Scotch's little sister um, or little brother, and uh, we had to say smooth, but. Irish whiskey was bold, it was complex, it was full body. That's what pot still is. It's thick, viscous, spicy liquid, you know, and um, it was eating and drinking and that sort of stuff. It's gorgeous, you know, and, and you can't you can't you can't call it smooth. It was never smooth. And anybody who's trying to make smooth Irish whiskey is um, not doing it any justice whatsoever. 
that we may not forget, or you're not allowed to forget that 1972 with Irish distillers, um, there was a monopoly basically, and even Bushmills came, became part of that family for many, many years. And they wrote the book on Irish history, or they rewrote the book on Irish history. <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah. It's, 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 it's always through the eyes of, of, of Irish distillers of the company called uh, you now Ricard, Ricard there, yeah? That's very true. And we have to take our hats off to them for surviving pot still yeah. whiskey. Such a high standard. My favorite whiskies are made there and they're phenomenal. They're phenomenal. But I think they're only scratching the surface of how good they can be. I think there would have been Irish whiskies of old that were nearly better. So hopefully... Uh, there's a lot of good work going down there. There's brilliant minds down there. Um, they do know their history and they know that they can create great whiskies. They probably have some non-compliant pot still sitting about in those warehouses. And that, that, what them. was it? A 27,000 euro pound whatever red breast that came out recently was peated. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Bring back Pete. Hmm. Bring back proper mash bills. Bring back the likes of the Bandon one. Or even in, in County Down here, we had Cumber Distillery that used to make these lovely you know fantastic whiskies as well it was full of oats and and stuff in there as well and yeah th that's what you want that's what you want people there's this this idea and people say it especially in, in middle europe like in the dutch for example are convinced that that a blend is a bad thing they're convinced that that i know and it's just it's just common knowledge which is wrong unfortunately and um misinformation and and they think that a single malt is much more superior than anything else and it's about educating the public, and we are getting there. It's not going to happen overnight, but pot still is on its way back, and um, as long as we don't release it too early and ruin the category. Now, tell me, how long are you maturing, and what kind of pot are you maturing it in? Um, we are we're mostly uh, we find our 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 peated pot still works very well in um, PX sherry casks. Um, but we're also we're toying around with everything. We've got whisk, we've got pots still lying in brandy casks, cognac casks. Um, we've got it lying in um, red wine pinot noir casks. We've got it lying in rye casks, um, rum casks. We're playing with everything um, just to see. But I think the core for for all distilleries is um, ex bourbon and sherry. But we try to deviate away from that. But um, we're working with different cask sizes, you know, and we're also working with, you know, reused casks that have been spent almost on very fresh casks as well, so we can bat them in together. But uh, yeah, there's there's a, a massive mixture of different casks in, in the distillery. There's especially the ones that are most creative for the ones that are about to be released in the coming months as part of our bonded experimental series. Uh, we've even got a cask from Hungary, which is great too. Zoltan uh, got us a a guy, he's um a bit of a whiskey celebrity. <laughs> he's got he's this got his own. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so he's got his his hands in many pies in Ireland, and he, he's supplying us with these beautiful Hungarian oak casks that are made from start to finish by hand. No kill drying, kill drying. The guys who make them actually cut down, cut down their trees themselves, and it's beautiful stuff, you know. Um, they, they select the trees and they know that in five years they're going to use that wood and they, they let it dry naturally and then they make it by hand. So it's a, it's a real craft and the, the quality of aging is fantastic out of them. You know, So yeah, looking forward to those whiskies as well. Now, how long do you want to age your whiskies? If you distill the way we distill, which is very inefficient and not so cost effective at the moment, the spirit stays in the still for a lot longer and it's much more interaction with the copper and it comes out much more palatable uh, even though it's full of oil it's still much more palatable uh, we notice that it doesn't take very long to age at all in fact we've got we've got whiskey that's sitting in, in our cask number one that we think is good for market and that's after a year i know that could change a lot in the next two years but i think that i think age statements Age statements are important, but I think that whole idea of an older whiskey being a better whiskey is another fallacy again that people need to wise up, just taste every whiskey on its own merit. Young whiskies can be fantastic when they're done right. And uh, yeah, we think most of our whiskies should be ready for market after three years. And that's the plan. All right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, um, what type of casks? Um, are, do, you, do you have any bourbon casks or are they all just basically ex wine casks at the moment? Yeah, we have bourbon casks as well. Yeah, we we source them. 
they're coming over from different distilleries. Um, there's also some rye casks. Um, we've got some, um, yeah. And then we've got the wine ones as well, white wine, red wine. Uh, we've got what well, we've done as well. We, we whenever um, over Christmas period, I, I thought I could still work. My, my staff were off, and mashing can be quite laborious. So what we done was uh, we got some molasses and some sugar in, and I made up some rum and distilled the rum. Uh, we put them into some of the, these uh, nice casks, which were um, heavily charred Cabernet Sauvignon casks, which we thought would add a little fruity, punchy spike into it. And uh, which was great, and um, it's it's aging nicely now. So uh, hopefully that'll be something nice to bring to the market as well. And uh, then we can reuse those rum casks ourselves for creating rum whiskey. So uh, yeah, so probably yeah, red wine, white wine, rye, okay. and rum yeah. casks. Very good, Greg. I want to burst your bubble here. That red breast expression. I think there's one of 470 bottles worldwide. They're going for 25,000 pounds um, each or something or euros. Um, mm -mm. <laughs> Nothing around 150 euros. I'm sorry. Um, not that world you're going to live in anymore. Sorry, that was 19 1955. <laughs> I don't. All right. Very very good. So tell me about your core range at the moment. What could I buy from you, and where could I buy it? Um, so we can get uh, potching and you can get mm -hmm. gin um, as well. We can get uh, any of our, our rum cask finish and our chocolina cask finish. There might be a few bottles still out there just before we release our next cask finish, a uh, 10 year old blend. You can get them online from irishmalts.com, um, which is very easy. Just click on the good bit of stock there and the shipping worldwide, very efficient, very quick, and very safe and reliable which is important. And um, we have never had any issues with our own bottles, thankfully. So it's well worth a shout. <laughs> you know? okay. And also, if you're in Germany, you know you can get it off irishwhiskies.de. Very, yep. very soon. Probably, yeah, that palette's probably there now. So I think she said so. It should be coming out next week, yeah. So yeah, she's, get, she's get, actually get, watching, yeah. Mike, or was watching. Let's see if she comments and, and mentions when we'll get that. All right, exactly. very, very nice. Yeah. So also, will I see you? If you're, in, if you're in Dublin as well, they can get it off um, the Celtic Whiskey Shop. And most yeah. independent off licenses around around the Northern Ireland area, we, we distribute it. We try to scatter it everywhere. We don't want sellouts. We want it lying in shops so people can just stumble across it mm -hmm. uh, in a few years, maybe. So. All right, what do you plan to do in the future? What are your future releases now? Um, <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything just yet, <laughs> but uh, the next one we're going back across the Atlantic Ocean for an influence over there again, uh, a nice influence finish. And then, so you have a good distributor in the States. Uh, yeah, we, we did. We, we were in, in discussions with one and uh, we've agreed to get over there. So, oh, I mean, our cask is coming from across the Atlantic Ocean, you know. Oh, okay, right. Other way around. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but we are hitting the States. We are uh, very soon, um, even though on a small scale. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. I suppose that'll that'll be in June time, maybe, or else July. So we'll be releasing more information very soon on that. So Mr. Kyle says Irish malts is a great service. My package has arrived actually here. Um, I haven't even opened it up. I have the, the seaweed whiskey in there. So Oh, very good. Yeah. The products are on the way, should be here by the end of the week, she says. Brilliant stuff, Rika. Brilliant. All right. Very good. Got a good girl there with her. She's doing a good job here in Germany. Now, will I see you at the Whiskey Live Dublin 2020? By all means, yeah. It was fantastic last year. You were, uh, you were just absolutely surrounded by people there. It was almost impossible to talk with you. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was brilliant. There was a good hunger for for probably new thought, and I think I think I'm not just trying to create the whiskey that I want to drink. I'm trying to create the whiskey that other people want to drink. And we're always willing to talk to people. And I'm only sorry I didn't get to spend more time chatting with people because the Irish whiskey industry is fantastic. It's worldwide. It's global. People from Germany and the States and Australia were all there, and all of our Irish colleagues too. And um, everybody's honest and appreciative. And um, it's a great community right now, and it's still growing. And, yeah, I can't wait to go back to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> me neither, me neither. That's going to be a good good thing here. Now, yeah. let's see here. I had one last question I wanted to ask you here. Um, so could could someone actually come visit you if they wanted to? 
yeah, we, we, we never turn away visitors. We are meant to have tours on a Saturday at three o'clock. Um, they're supposed to last for an hour. Most of them last over two hours. <laughs> the time you get chatting and, you know, it's just, um, it's always good to see people and good to see people who are interested in, in, in the distillery. And uh, it's a good way to make new friends. And um, a lot of times people come and they, they come back again for another tour. Um, they want to see what we're doing differently and how things have changed and how the stills have aged because they're beautiful and shiny behind you there. But in reality now, the flame has been licking up around them for a very long time. The wall at the back has started to get full of soot. So the joys of flame-fed distillation. Every so often we whitewash it again and then the flame comes back, you know. Sorry. Somebody's looking alcohol gel. <laughs> <laughs> so Rowan asks, um, have you a favorite age for whiskey, Brendan? Um, age, all I think all ages. Um, like this, this one here is no age statement. It's my favorite whiskey, you know, and um, it's it's um, it's definitely not a ten year old or anything like that. In fact, Peters hasn't been going that long. Um, my favorite whiskey at the moment, right now, I think, is. Probably this one, the Donville's PX Cask Frank. Gorgeous Ooh, stuff. That was good. We had it at a whiskey tasting the other night at Belfast Whiskey Club, which is definitely the world's best whiskey club. It's put up, Paul O'Kane put up that as one of the samples. It was fucking awesome. Wow. And uh, yeah, and um, I always go back to as well as my, my um, the rum cask. I just think it's great. I love it. You know, we're always trying to create whiskeys that we want to drink. So it's good to get back to it and enjoy it. So for me, it's not about age. Definitely not. It's more about the honesty and, and, and the story of a whiskey. And, and you, so it's good to, have, to know what you're drinking. You know, and um, yeah. And Jarlith, whiskey. Um, Jarlith Watson gave me a little sample of that when I was in Dublin. That was so nice. <laughs> it is indeed. Yeah, it's it's been long awaited. And uh, I think every five years we might get to get something similar as it gets older and older, you know, which is good. Yeah. Very good. So let me ask a couple, couple questions about Irish whiskey in general. What, Where do you see the Irish whiskey um, industry in three to five years from now? Uh, as long as we keep doing things right and we don't follow just this model of triple distillation uh, bourbon casks and then a sherry finish you know if we just keep trying to be regional and keep trying to be different then then we can uh, there's a bit of bullshit going on in the industry as well we need to cut that out uh, it, it doesn't do us favours in the long run might make a nice build up but um, people can see through it well maybe they can't yeah maybe it's important to keep keep that going too I don't know but it's definitely going to keep growing but I think integrity bottlings are the way forward in my opinion I, do, I definitely agree and right, I think we're good enough. So yeah, you've actually answered this question here from David. What are you whiskey? Was sure. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah, Belgrove definitely, uh, yeah. which is a, a ray. Yeah. Okay, and of course, Irish whiskey is going to continue to grow here with such passion and nice people. Very, very good. Now, what? Um, sometimes I take a look at the future, and sometimes I kind of see speed bump in the future that's going to have to be avoided or somehow gotten around what would be the speed bump here for irish whiskey in the future um god uh i hopefully we, we changed the, the the technical file the gi for pot still needs changed it's a, okay it's a bloody disgrace it just needs changed it needs to be more historically accurate um i think the current excuse is tradition which is a, a pathetic excuse we just need to educate people that it needs to be changed and then it will be changed now we tell me um how and who are we in, in Scotland? We'd have the Scotch SWA, Scotch Whiskey Association. What do we have in Ireland? Um, oh, oh, the, the um, no, we've just got um, the Department of Agriculture or the authority on on the um, on the, the Irish whiskey. So uh, the Department of Agriculture, and then there's there's different associations uh, in Ireland as well. There's the Irish Whiskey Society, which are a group of dedicated individuals. They're a brilliant bunch. There's the Irish Whiskey Association as well, which represents a group of businesses. Um, they also help their own the members out and create um, tourism trails mm -hmm. for their own members as well. Yep. And uh, outside of that, no, there's just independent people working on their own. Uh, mm -hmm. as well. 
So, um, but there's great camaraderie amongst them all. Um, all of these groups do brilliant things for the, um, you know, for their members as well, and do brilliant things for the for the industry as a whole, and for to do brilliant things for international growth, which is very important, you know. So, um, uh, as they say in Ireland, Ninyard go Kaila." There's no strength without unity. So everybody <laughs> moving forward together and doing a great job. Very good. If anyone else has any questions here for Brandon, they can ask them. That's great. Now, um, your distillery, will you expand or will you always stay, I'm going to say, tiny? <laughs> uh, well, at the moment, we, we're going to stay a tiny. But uh, especially with this, probably we're going to have a, a year's worth of a recession ahead now after this. So, um, But honestly, I, I think we should grow. I think eventually we will double in size, which means we would have a sister distillery very nearby in the same area that would just be the same size. And uh, we could do something maybe slightly different there. So the two could be, you know, juxtaposed maybe or else very similar, but some slight difference. I don't know. But they could be, you know, tasted together and you could recognize the similarities, but at the same time, the differences. And that, that would, that's what I would love. Maybe, maybe one's flame fed and the other isn't, or there's a difference in the fermentations or something like that. But the same principles and, and disciplines, definitely. All right. Yeah. All right. So now for us, YouTuber and the entire um, social media um, community, what would you expect or what would you like to have more from us as whiskey tubers, as we like to call ourselves? I think the content has been brilliant. Um, it's it's always it's always interesting. You can always go on and find something new. Um, you you guys are always touched an indication of what the public want, but at the same time you're also influencers, which is great. So uh, the likes of you, you like in integrity bottlings, path filters its way down to the uneducated consumer, and they become educated, and then they want the, the same discipline. They they want those that that type of product, which is great, and. Uh, but yeah, what we want more of from you, um, I don't know, keep it going. It's been great so far. <laughs> it really has, you know. We're very enjoying good. it. So I would like to share very briefly at the end your website, if I may. Um, yep. Let me see here. There we go. So we have here the bottles, for example. You have your gin, you have your whiskey, you have your pitchin. Um, you have here your distills, which I have here in the back. Um, back you have here your warm tub condenser. We can click on that. And you actually get here more information, which is actually a great website. Um, all that information is there. That's very, very good. Do you would you say you post a little bit more here to um, Instagram, or where do you post the most? Um, I need to increase uh, the amount of social media. I do I don't really get much time, but I'd like to get onto Twitter more. It seems good okay. fun. But I find if I post on Instagram, it jumps onto my Facebook as well, which is great. So both of them are related. And yeah. whenever I have anything I post online, it goes automatically onto the website too. So uh, it's great that way. But um, yeah, hopefully I get more onto Twitter. It's great fun. And uh, there's a lot right. of good, good whiskey knowledge on there. Very, very good. So there's a tiny little um, Twitter uh, Irish whiskey community even there with Barry and with yeah. um, Otmar. What is his name? Omar. Omar, exactly. Omar, Omar yeah. he's, he's, Omar. he's, wow. It's good fun. There's a lot of characters, isn't there, in the industry? Yeah, there are. Oh. <laughs> right, Rowan asked, and maybe this is one of the last questions here, is it difficult to keep a consistent temperature with your direct uh, uh, fire stills? Uh, in the wintertime, definitely. We've got these uh, flues, which are going out the back, and the base of the still is a little outlet to try and bring oxygen in to create the flame uh, at just the right amount. But see, when you've got a, a windy day, or any storm, the autumn, for example, the, the autumn storms, the wind comes down and it blows out the flame. And, you know, sometimes you have to make sure the flame's still alight. And yeah, it's very difficult there. Um, but you'll notice that they just heat up very slowly. So it's very inefficient uh, heating process when then a lot of the heating is just at the base and it's creating a lot of burning, which uh, you never want too much of, but, but yeah, it's, it's good. They're not 100% reliable. And they're not 100% efficient either. So <clears throat> that's, that's it. All right. Very, very good. So, um, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please come on Twitter, <laughs> Greg says. <laughs> good All man, right. Greg. Yeah, I will do. Yeah. <laughs>
And I think there's a great bunch of people on Twitter, Tina, also confirms these. And your CAS experiments are very, very much um, in demand over here in Germany and also in mainland Europe. That'd be good. All right, great. So thank you very much for having the time today to talk to me in this very, very difficult um, crisis mode that you're in with all your help that you're doing for the community. Thank you very much. If someone has any questions, we can contact you on Twitter or on Facebook or through the website. I'm sure um, they can yeah. get in direct contact with you. And I hope to see you in person then in November if I don't make it up to Ireland before that. Let's see what happens, all right? If not, I'll probably see you in Germany or something. So <laughs> Maybe you'll be here first. That could be great. All right. Very, very nice. All right. Whiskey Jason here. Whiskey from the viewpoint of the American here in Germany. Thank you very much for watching. Bye, folks. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.